Hi, I'm Dave Clark. Welcome to my floating studio in Amsterdam. And uh, today we're going to talk about a variety of different things. Um, hopefully I won't give away too many secrets. Um, but we're going to be talking about uh, the remix that me and Mr. Jones did of Phil Kieran featuring Bush Tetris. And also uh, going to be talking about the remix that me and Mr. Jones did of one of my all-time synth heroes, John Fox. Uh, with uh, underpass and um, yeah I'm going to talk about various things from plugins 32 64 bit problems and um, hardware and the amount of heat that it generates even on the water of today Welcome. Um, this is uh, a rather simple little arrangement uh, which was done on behalf of Phil Kieran, who I believe is now known uh, to all interviewees as uh, Philip. Um, and uh, he did a track which uh, a couple of years ago which featured an old sort of uh, 80s punk funk uh, group called Bush Tetris uh, under the guise of Burglar Tom. And um, eventually he managed to find the right people to get the right licenses for it. And uh, he asked me if I wanted to do a remix. And I said yes. And I did this remix along with someone who's not here today, uh, but hopefully we'll see him later, is uh, Mr. Jones, who's a guy from Harlem. And uh, we did this together. And um, it's been a couple of weeks since I've been on Logic. And those people that know Logic quite well, a couple of weeks can seem like a lifetime. Um, I don't really have any particular method in the way that I work. Uh, if it's my own track, which I haven't done for a very, 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 very long time, I generally start off with absolutely nothing and, and build from there. With a remix, uh, it can be uh, either completely different or this one, I always really like the original thing that Phil did, but I wanted to make it stronger. So we start off with all the uh, the samples like everyone does and I get Jones to uh, put them into the, I think it's the EX24, uh, the Logic Sampler. Uh, I haven't learned the Logic Sampler yet. Um, I'm still in my mind uh, touching buttons and stuff on, on a sampler. And uh, whenever he does the sampler, he hides, he, he can make the whole of these screens disappear so I can't actually see what he's doing. Um, but basically Jones always sets up all the samples in Logic and then we start manipulating and then we do the arrangement together and uh, production, I do most of the production um, and that's how it sort of works out. Um, as you can see, I've got a few things here. Um, on this screen here is where all the meters are. Um, I'm a bit of a meter fiend. I don't know why. I've got meters absolutely everywhere, uh, including this DK audio thing here. But I like to see what's happening with the track. I like to see what's happening with the energy of the track. I'd like to make sure there's absolutely no clipping whatsoever um, because at least in digital, you, you shouldn't clip as everyone now should know, hopefully. Um, so you just make sure you catch everything as early on as possible. Um, everything that comes out of here uh, goes into here. And there's uh, quite a few compressors here. And they're all fed into the first eight uh, channels. Uh, the, the last eight channels are sort of auxiliaries um, and feed separate things into them. Um, then from the mixer, it comes out into a little unit under here, which is an old BBE thing, uh, which is about 30, 30 euros, probably on, on uh, eBay now, but I won't get rid of it. It's fantastic. I even believe it has balanced ins and outs. I think that's why I kept it too. Uh, then it goes to uh, the UBK here, which at the moment is switched out. Um, that adds a little bit of sheen and uh, a little bit of presence and a little bit of breathiness if you need it a little bit of um, cleanliness, I suppose, uh, to the signal before it then goes into uh, one of these compressors. Um, I believe on this particular track, I actually bypassed the SSL because I was having a few issues with uh, it not being quite right on the transient, so I went through the gyroph. And then from the gyroph, it then goes into the crane song, uh, which adds second, third, and fifth harmonics, which kind of give that tape saturation effect, but also it just, sticks everything together so basically everything that comes out of, of of the master is put in the process which hopefully makes it all stick together and then it's fed back into uh, the symphony 
and then recorded in the background in real time on Bias Peak, where I top and tail it and uh, remove the DC offset if there is one and a variety of other things, make sure there's no uh, nasty little peaks that some of the hardware compressors didn't catch and just uh, physically look at it uh, as a waveform and make sure everything's cool. And then afterwards I then go onto Ozone, but that's a whole different story. As for the track itself, as I say, I have no real methods in working um, per se. Uh, with this particular one, um, as most people, when there's a new plugin that comes in, it's like, wow, let's use the new plugin. And at that particular moment, like about a couple of weeks before, I believe, uh, Waves brought out the NLS, which you can see all along here. And I thought it would be kind of fun to have the NLS. Uh, I think I used the Nevo. I think that's the Nevo. Is it? No, the mic. I used the mic one. And as you can see, they've all got different VCA groups, just for fun, really. It's all about having fun, I think. And that's what I like to do. Make it complicated if necessary, but just let your mind be free. Um, as you can see here, uh, we have the groups. So you see Smart 1 and 2, which is the Smart uh, Compressor, Distributor, Appy, Avalon, and then all the other ones. Uh, looks like I didn't use 13 or 14 or 14 or 15. Um, I have here something which says play here. Um, I read somewhere, I can't remember where I read it, but if you actually play the track, when you actually select that particular one, apparently it causes less distress to the cores. I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, but if you can see here, I've got on constant watch what's happening with the cores. Um, it's an eight core machine, uh, early 2008 actually, and has no hyper threading and is quite basic in what it does, but it's still, it's okay, it's okay. Um, no, I don't really start off with, with anything, I suppose. It's like, with this particular track for me, I think it's the bass line. So that's, that's where it's at, that's where the funk is there, and then you want to concentrate on that, and then, you know, but with like a techno track, then of course you, you're much more heading towards the percussion first. And, and doing the drums. Um, but here is like, it's all about song structure for, for me anyway. It's like working out where to put the vocals, making sure the vocals are telling a story and that it's a song. And um, the bass line itself is like the, obviously the backbone of the track. So you've got to make sure you've got the frequencies right. And then you've got to make sure that the, the vocals sit on top of everything in such a way where it just really gels together. You can see here I've got a very good stereo display so I can find out what's going on with the stereo imaging and the phase. Uh, here is what's coming out the desk, that's what's going into the head and so that I make sure I never clip the amps. Uh, that's what's actually feeding into the amp as well. Uh, also got a fast Fourier transformation which is rather useful as is the um, third of the octave there. And I use that when I'm soloing tracks, engineering them live. The way that I like to see my track is quite it's always like this. I don't like the mid-range. Uh, I find mid-range hurts me quite a lot, um, so I try and take that down quite heavily. Um, as you can see, everything seems to be blended together. Uh, with the bass, I've got a bass rider going, uh, which is kind of fun. It kind of works, kind of nice. If I just solo out the bass, um, just put a loop here. So I'm soloing out the bass now. Everything is here for a purpose, whether it's the right purpose that it was designed for, who knows, but it just makes everything sound correct. With the sub bass, um, I'm using the UAD uh, BX, you have to excuse me at the moment, I'm running 64 bit, which means that the 32 bridge, two bridge uh, is active, which uh, might cause issues. But I absolutely adore this. I first came into this with the UAD. Um, it's just amazing. It's just so precise. Uh, one of the things that I like about this, it takes me back to when I used to do vinyl, is the, the mono maker. Um, bass can be stereo, it's not a problem, but I actually enjoy having some bass in mono so you don't have weird things happening. Um, but if I was to bypass this, you might hear a difference, I'm not sure. You can hear it's not... It's not so fat. 
this is a lot more substantial underneath so if I use that to shape it I get rid of everything that's above a certain frequency it's absolutely set to a ballistic level by the way I'm sorry for that but hey artists can be emotional as well as mathematicians I think um, the next thing that I've got going here is the the little labs voice of God um, it's a strange animal this it's kind of weird um, sometimes you, you try everything you can't get it to work and other times it does work and if you actually listen here there's a big presence bypassed it's gone so it's just it's just nice it's there it's adding something that tickles underneath again from vinyl days I don't seem to have very much going on 2025 Hertz because I don't know why habit I suppose it's not necessary these days because um, vinyl isn't the main uh, tool of, of the trade for, for a lot of people not causing any offense of course um, then you got the the low air which is kind of fun too uh, which was already there. Uh, let's have a look. Again, big difference if I bypass it. It's completely out of control. You can hear it with the speakers, they're cracking a little bit. But I put it back in, and all of a sudden it's just, just where you want the bass to be. It's just very, 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 very smooth. So that's very, very useful. And then uh, again, <laughs> I think I brought in another. Uh, yeah, another another brain works. Again, these things aren't necessary, but it's, you just throw things in and then get them all to work together. And if I was again to click out this, it's out of control. And then the last thing, of course, is just for fun, is, is the Moog filter. It just always makes things sound a little bit smoother. Um, always forget how to bypass on, on the Moog. Here we go, yep. So you can almost hear the original sound coming through. So a lot of processing on the bass, but people that know my productions kind of expect that, I suppose. And then you hear the other bass that's coming in there as well, which is uh, try and get them both to work together. But that bass there, if I just loop this, let's go back here again. So I go here, you'll see a few things that are going on with that. Uh, a bass rider again. It's just nice, nice thing to have. Um, the Lex Chorus, which is down there. If I actually mute the Lex Chorus, you'll hear what's going on. It just adds that little bit of texture, which is nice to have. Hopefully, if it's going to bypass. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Some plugins take a while to do shit. I don't know why. So if you hear it without the the chorus, it sounds quite dry. It's, it's a nice thing to have. It's not as nice as the um, the old lexicon that I used to have, the uh, 960. But maybe that's just in my head because it had like physicality attached to it. Although when I bought it at Funky Junk all those years ago, I remember I think it was Mark saying to me, "Oh, I see that lexicon make Windows computers now." Uh, so who knows? Um, but when you get them both playing together, then you hear how it actually sits. As you can see the computer's being a bit moody today. <laughs> but it just sits together nicely, it sits there, and it looks good on, on, on display there, so I feel happy with it. Um, the drums, always in black, makes it easier to see. You can hear with the drum, I wanted a little bit of a sort of 80s slap back on it, so I added the 224. Just, just got a little bit of, you know, atmosphere again. It's all about the atmosphere, I think. And then if you play that uh, with the drum loop. So what I tend to do with a drum loop is, because I want to be in control of the bass more, I'll drop out the bass on the drum loop. So then I can have the my own bass drum in there. and then bring the snare in. Jones was spending ages getting the timing of the snare so that it fitted the loop and not the quantization pattern. And that's why it fits together and then you add the bass line. So 
just getting everything to sit together. Yeah, so what you got here is you got uh, all the drums in black, uh, labeled in black, because they go through the distressor here. And they're in group uh, one, most of them. So if you change the faders, it's like a group fader. So once I got the balance right, because it's difficult to get the balance right because obviously using outside compression as well. If I was to solo all the drums, If I do this, you'll hear a big difference. Yeah. It's making it. It's a little bit asthmatic. I don't do side chaining, by the way. Never have. Never wanted to. So, um, it just gives that texture. And then, of course, they're all being compressed as well here too. So, if you if I play it from. More together, so all of these are feeding through with my mouse gun. I've actually so much screen acreage here, right? I actually found this little thing which uh, people use for tutorials is like you can't whistle for where your mouse is, so I actually got it to do this little red little ring after five seconds so I can find where my bloody mouse is. Because at some point we're going, Where the fuck is it? It's like, uh huh. But uh, yeah, so everything is, is going through the drum bus, which you know, it just sounds like shit. But yeah, the, the original vocals, I assume, um, Phil got off, off final. And in a way, it reminds me of the track that I did um, on Devil's Advocate, which is, uh, uh, which one was it? It's featuring Coon Daddy. And the snip, 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 everybody just ride. And it kind of reminds me of that because from listening to the original track, that's what happens is like just does these vocals and the track comes in does the vocals and the track comes in um i don't think we did that much with the with the vocals to be honest apart from ad uh just a absolutely anal with the uh the editing which uh, jones was doing i said we need to make sure that we get this get that get rid of all the pops just do it actually in the editing uh, rather than processing so that way it's always done it's done forever so i've also got on the vocals I've got, uh, you'll hear it, the broadcasty down there, I've got an M7 broadcasty. Uh, the lexicon reverbs are nice, but there's something about having a solid uh, reverb actually in a rack. I don't know what it is, you don't think about it, it's just there. And the broadcasty just has a really nice sound, so it's just nice to have. Put the broadcasty on there just to, to add some. Um, uh, again, atmosphere, make it all gel together so you don't feel like it's record spin, ding a ling, you know, because like everything that was going on afterwards did like a very short fade out and then of course um, silenced, complete silence. Like in the old days, that would be a noise gate, but you can just do it and it's done for good. Record spin, right. Oh, it's automated off. just add a little bit of tail. And that's what the beautiful thing is about the automation is, um, it just gives you a chance to be really creative with stuff. In the old days it was okay to do, but not as easy. Record spin. Ding a -ling. Ding a -ling. Ding a -ling. I just want everything to sit together and not use uh, energy that's available for other things to come through. Because if you've got some sort of, uh, if, you're not, if you're lazy with your EQ and everything's coming through, um, and then you've got something which, you know, like a, a mid-range that you need to come through, but you've got a bass there, which is also taking out the mid-range space, then it doesn't tell the story very well. And I've always learned that it's best to be, you know, give everything its own space to tell the story. And that's what I've always tried. And with, with analog EQ, uh, not this, it's not really so much EQ, it's more psychoacoustic, I think. But with analog EQ, you could never be that precise. You know, for, for me, I've always not been that satisfied with analog EQ as a tool. Uh, and then digital EQ, 
was always great. I mean, for me, I'd use very, very basic in the, in the form of maybe a filter in the old samplers and move the filter notch along to find out where I wanted something cut off. Um, but for, for me, digital EQ is definitely very, very important. And actually, I use the BX almost for everything if I want to surgically touch something. Um, if I don't and I want some character, then I might look at some of the UAD stuff like uh, I think it's the, the Triton, isn't it? Uh, Trident. Trident, yeah. And I might use some of that and, you know, it has some nice sort of like mid-rangey sort of presence. Uh, the Mach, I call it the Mach because I'm living in Holland. It's actually the Mag. Uh, but the Mach um, is actually surprisingly good. I don't know how, what, what, but it, it's just... It sort of reminds me of my old Focusrite ISAs that I used to have. A friend of mine who actually bought all my uh, studio equipment, and he's still a friend, um, uh, he, he sort of said when I did a remix of Slam, like the vocal sound like it had gold sprayed on them. And these kind of do that, but more platinum. It's really very airy and very, very breathy, and, but not to the point where it's annoying and almost sibilant. Um, and I actually find, found these very, very good. And the fact they're 64 bit is also rather wonderful too. Um, very, very simple and very, very easy. Um, and you just do each one to, to the sound. You can always use it. You can, it's actually very difficult to not use, want to use these also on everything too. Um, but I use it more as a, a, a high lift presence effect, I suppose. Uh, and then I use the BX as like, let's get in there, let's really hone in the um, I'm not really a fan of the Waves EQs uh, at all. Sort of remind me a little bit of the way that digital desks work and, 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 and operate with the little balls and stuff. Uh, the drum loop and the snare. Um, so, again, probably just adding a little bit of presence on the snare. Uh, let's go back here. It's going to be moody today, I think. It just adds a little bit of presence, I think. Oh, which one? There you go. Just a little bit. Just, it's got that, it's just that sweetness at the end, which you wouldn't get. And then with the drum loop, they're all tiny things. That was too bright, so moving it around a bit just gives that a little bit more mid-range and allows the other snare to come through on top. These meters blew me away. Before uh, I was using these meters, I was using the Duros, and that's nice, but these are so much more accurate in one go, and I'm looking at them. Uh, the only thing that I wish that you could do uh, with a lot of these meters is also have different types of ballistics like, you know, with, with this, this old beast here, I've had this for like eight years or nine years, maybe even longer. And I dread to think what's going to go when it's gone. Um, it's just amazing. It's so precise. You can change the ballistics. You can change the colors and certain things really easily. Um, but me meters, man, I just love meters. It just makes me feel like I'm a scientist. Well, I met Jones in, uh, well, I've been playing his music for ages and it almost became a bit of a joke in a way because I was playing almost a new track of his almost every single week for maybe 30 weeks or something. And everyone was going, who is this Jones guy? It's Dave, really. He's pretending to be Mr. Jones. And then we met in Utrecht at uh, a gig that was at, uh, I, I kid you not, it's called the Winkel van Sinkel. Yeah, the Winkel van Sinkel. Uh, which is around the centre of Utrecht and he was there and I met him. And I thought, oh, he's a really cool guy. He's really, you know, easy to talk to and, and stuff. And then uh, I took it slowly. And then after a while, I said to him, well, how do you fancy coming and meeting me on the boat on the studio? So. I was learning to use Appleton, but wasn't finding it what I wanted. 
and I had no real experience in Logic and Jones was uh, using Logic and he basically brought me into Logic which I'm really happy for and then I felt very happy with Logic because it was very similar to what I was aware of with uh, Cubase what I was using it up to when I was doing Devil's Advocate uh, but there's obviously some things within Logic that I wasn't aware of and you know so he brought to the table just ways of working with Logic uh, which helped me come back into making music again. I know how to work with Logic and I'm still learning how to use Logic because Logic is a big tool and um, for me it was like two worlds come together I am the digital area and Dave is also you know the hardware stuff so for me it was in between I learned the hardware stuff using and why the digital stuff worked that way because it's also a different thing why are you using that typical plugin or whatever and that's what I so you learned about the analog side of things from that yeah. And why plugins working like that, and exactly. how to use it. Yeah, that, that, that brings me a whole other world, a whole other yeah, dimension of producing electronic music. Yeah. We started off a remix, um, but it didn't go anywhere in the direction of the track that, that was supposed to be a remix of. It went somewhere else. Like this happens a lot when you make music. Uh, and so we have this track, and I have an idea. We did it together. We we can finished it because we knew it was going to be ours uh, and then I got this idea to do some vocals over it as well so hopefully if I get the right vocals not me obviously and not Jones uh, but if I get the right vocals done on top of it and I'm happy with it then I think we can take it further yep. and then if that happens then I think we should do other other tracks I think I think it's an inevitability because I sort of use remixing as a way of just getting back into production without necessarily having my name fully emblazoned upon something and just re I have to relearn things uh, that's really, really important. And also as a team, to uh, do remixing is how uh, um, someone's working, you know, the, com the communication between two people is very important, especially with music, because it's it's a progress, and music has to be, you know, a natural thing. If you have, you know, uh, the same ideas or the things at the same level, it will, you know, collapse at some point, and I think it will happen, uh, especially with music, it has to grow. and. From there, you, you can say it's going to be our track, like they've said, you know, from the remix. At some point, it's like, I really like this, it's going to be ours. Because we, more, we use more our own stuff than the original stuff from the remix, so that's the problem. Yeah. So, here we are. Um, in front of a mix that uh, both me and uh, Mr. Jones have not seen for probably about six months, I think. I think we finished it uh, around December. When did we When did we finish it? Do you think, or was it later than that? December or around? Yeah. So it's a long time ago that we did this. Um, computer was basically on 32-bit. Uh, Logic was. So that's why you see shitloads of UAD uh, plugins happening right now. In fact, there were so many plugins happening that we're using 75% of DSP and 75% of Firewire, so there's quite a lot of UAD plugins. Um, the UAD plugins seem to fit this project because a lot of the plugins are all about heritage, and uh, Arturia came up with some synths just released, which also fitted this again for heritage. Um, it's a very, very complicated mix, so it's going to take a little while to explain it to myself as well as to you guys, because uh, there's some weird routing and shit going on, but as you can see, um, quite quite a bit, quite a lot going on. Um, this is not quantized at all, and this caused quite a lot of interesting um, uh, reactions to what you're used to yourself when you're making music. Um, thinking, shit, this sounds really badly out of time. That sounds badly out of time. But uh, I kept with it um, and sort of pushed Jones to do a lot of cutting um, to make sure that all the audio samples sounded correct. And when you listen to things in isolation uh, with something else in isolation, so like maybe a bass, bass line and, and a bass drum, it sounds pretty weird. Um, but if you put everything all together, it has that magic gel. And um, being a massive fan of John Fox, it was also a privilege to work on. So as you can see, a lot going on. None of it's quantized. Um, vocals did two things with the vocals uh firstly really cleaned them up um because they're original stems and they came from 1979 i think which you know is, is remarkable um 
wanted to really stereoize them, but when you stereoize a lot of vocals, sometimes you lose that middle presence. So what I used to do as an old sampling trick is have mono and then stereo, and then you've always got the mono that's keeping everything um, in its place, and then you've got the stereo which is surrounding it, kind of engaging it like a sort of really weird sort of cloud. So as you can see here, everything that's in, in black is in mono, uh, and that keeps the underpinning of the vocals there. And everything that you see here in orange, um, aside from being in Holland, of course, is, is basically just uh, stereo. Um, with a lot of the vocals you'll see here, uh, use the, the vocal rider just to come in and come out so that it sounds natural, because obviously when you're cleaning samples up, it has the, the ability of not sounding natural. Um, and when the samples are being cleared up, uh, there's a lot of other things that have been added to actually then gel it back together again. Uh, so you got the um, you got the UAD Cooper uh, time clue, and you have to uh, time cube. You have to excuse me because I can only use uh, one plug-in at a time, and that basically just adds a little bit of echo, keeps it alive, and keeps it well placed. And then over here, you got even more shit going on, uh, which is where all the vocals are actually eventually coming through. Uh, and then you got the um, SSL E just to give that a little bit of sound. Sometimes I don't even use the SSLE, I just have it as a plugin. Makes me feel better, I don't know why, it just does sometimes. Maybe tweak it a little bit, but I don't think we tweaked it at all on this one. Um, you got the UAD uh, Ampex, again, um, this is kind of cool. I think I set the tape speed to quite fast, I'm not sure, I can't remember exactly. Um, not massively fast, 15 inches per second. Um, Sometimes if you don't want to have a budget uh, sound, then you go for 30 inches per second because you think, hey, I can afford all this tape, but of course it doesn't really happen, but it just makes you feel good. So 15 inches per second makes it sound quite good for vocals because of the high frequencies. Um, and one of the things that really stuck it together afterwards, I thought was the uh, UAD MXR flanger. It just gave it that spacey sound. So if we actually listen to the vocals, hopefully it won't throw a kiddie fit, but... Um, And then we add all the vocals together, you'll hear it thickening up. Hopefully, it should be fine. Um. Over all the bridges. Echoes in rows. Yeah. Talking at the same still have a really good sense of presence. And then if you look at the vocals here, you'll see some of the stereoized back vocals are taken out and let the mono vocal come in. So you've got that multi-dimension coming in. So sometimes he's in the back, sometimes he's around you. And that makes a lot of sense. And again, the same with the actual uh, underpass itself. And I did very well to call it underpass. Sorry, just as, as a child, uh, as a song when it came out, I was very, very young and had my own vocals for it, which I believe many people did. Hopefully it's going to happen at some point. Or if it's not, then I'm going to have to look at something else. Uh, 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 uh. No, it's going to come on something else. But anyway, that's the general gist of it. Um, the original version was recorded in 1978, 79, around that time from the album uh, Metamatic, which was uh, an astounding album. I bought it for the cover like you do as a kid and uh, just was lucky, like I was when I bought Devo again for the cover. Very, very lucky. Um, lots of tracks on there. I used to have a little red uh, record deck that was run on batteries and I used to have it outside the bath and when I used to sit in the bath, like all English people do, um, I used to listen to it and I'd shout out to my mum to turn it over the record and I just listened to it all the time. Um, so much so that I even named one of the tracks on my first album, No One's Driving, just out of homage to, 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 to John. Um, so obviously the original being recorded in 79 means that it sounds quite thin compared to what you can do with production now, uh, although it still sounds very futuristic. And we just kept adding loads and loads and loads of synthesizers just to make it really, really fat. And if I take off all the solos, hopefully there's nothing left on solo anymore. 
We go to the beginning, take off the loop. You'll hear a very, very fat intro. With a lot of bass. Again, I don't know if you're filming that, but you'll see a shitload of bass there. Just wanted to add massive amounts of frequency, really, that wasn't available for the recording technology. Bass drum was a bit of a bastard. It was a bit of a weird bass drum. Um, but again, wanted to sit there. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of doubling up of uh, all, all the synth sounds. It's not sounding correctly in balance because the compressors are set for other things and, and the mixing level is set for other things. But it was a great project to work on. Um, fantastic, you know, like the bass sounds. You couldn't do that in the original, I don't think. Um, and Paul Jones, uh, ma maximum kudos because he spent a lot of time moving parts around just to get it to sound that it's in time even though it's not quantized. I for forbade him to use the quantize button. Hello, I'm Mr. Jones, <laughs> the other half of uh, Unsubscribe. And um, also for me, a uh, huge honor to do this because it's different than the music I make before. Um, technically wise or structure wise almost on everything um, and also um, because Dave is a huge fan of John Fox so for me double up a more honor and, and also a lot of fun because it's an unknown area for me um, the first time I heard the samples I was a little bit scared because like Dave said before, it's not quantized. Everything is a little bit off time. So for me, it was um, very listening and looking at the waves and um, how he, uh, he used it uh, in his own track and uh, what the flow it is in the original. Um, but, you know, the original and this are totally different. So first, I get the, uh, the audio files in, I listen to it. Take drum. How they are, and it's, oh, this is the vocals. Uh, drag it in the, into the project, I will, I will show you. So you see the, f the actually, the waves in it. As you can see, exactly the, 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 uh, the sound waves of the, the vocal, was John is singing and saying. I'll move it to here. Closer. Here we go. Standing in the dark. Uh, and first, I ask always on Dave how he would like it. Uh, the whole line of separate. Um, use it as a structure or what else. And um, then I. Standing in the dark. Then I cut every word in it or. Uh, for example, this point, in the dark. this part, I cut it, make it clean. Um, Dave is really onto details, so it must be clean without clicking or background stuff. Um, and then I cut it in pieces, uh, give it a name, uh, because a labeling is very, as you can see, very important. Uh, because now, six months later, I have searched for the files and it's very difficult still. Uh, I cut it, uh, make it an audio file, label it, uh, drag it into the X24 we use as, as a sampler. Uh, and it looks like this. I hope you can see it. And uh, from here, um, we can use it as a, a MIDI file. Um, give it an, uh, a place on the keys. So we can play up, down, up, down, which words we don't use, and uh, a little bit later. And um, the reason we like to uh, use the MIDI file is you can easily uh, move it around in, yeah, in the project itself. And uh, still, a lot of things were out of time, so I have to go back again into the audio file, cut a little bit uh, uh, shorter, longer, move it a little bit around, and, um, you know, upload it. Uh, load it again into the X24 and so on so on 
until it sounds great and we are both satisfied. Yeah, and then we listen a few times to it, eh, Dave? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, he's cameraman as well. Oh, God. <laughs> Big Brother's watching me. Uh, yes, as you can see, we don't use audio files. Um, so every sound is in MIDI um, because the, the logic will work a little bit faster sometimes and um, it's also easy to, to see which word or which sentence um, the MIDI is uh, because we can you know use a, a lot of colors give everything another name you get lost so yeah this is also for me a new way to make music because when I'm making my own uh, uh, stuff is I put my audio file in it given it a lot of color because I don't have to communicate with another person so the labeling and, and uh, the MIDI thing is, for me, a new world, very, uh, very helpful as well. I use uh, everything in Logic, uh, Logic, Logic. Uh, as you can see, I, I drag it in here, uh, click it open, and it, you know, uh, open up in the sample editor. And as you can see, there's something here in the middle. You can uh, cut it out, uh, you, but you can also use the function here, silent or you know fade in, fade out, and you have to be yeah you, know, you have to do it everywhere. After that, you know still you hear some air, uh, or clicking or whatever, uh, and then it's Dave's turn to use a lot of plugins to get it tighter as well. <laughs> it's old school. Uh, but you know the new thing is put it in the in the yeah in the sampler and uh, make yeah, use it as a MIDI file. I think that is a new new thing. You know, having all the audio files in there because the machine you know if you get the thousands of sounds there, it won't work fine. So that is the the the, the audio part of you know from scratch when we get all the parts in. As you can see, it's it, the, the, the audio files are six or seven minutes, so it's like, you know, the, the, the lines back in the days. Nowadays you get smaller parts, you know, one bar or a few bars. And also in MIDI, it helps also a lot. You know, with this one you have to figure out what tone or what, you know. I don't have a really great musical background, so it was a lot of listening, 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 and everything was, yeah was correct. Everything, the kicks, if you like the kick, if you like the snare, if you like the hi-hats or whatever in it, the guitar riffs, uh, we use it and then it's the same, it's the same thing as, as the vocals. You see it as a cloud, you, you, you make it clean and uh, how we like to use it, use it like this, we cut it, reverse it or whatever. And, and then yeah, we, we, we talk about it like how we really want to use it. And then it's come into the project or not, because even in a project, you know, I got a lot of ideas, Dave got a lot of ideas, and then, you know, the, the, uh, um, the project will grow. It's, it's oh, easy, because uh, when I cut it uh, like this, yeah. um, it's not exactly, you can go to audio file and then save selection. It appears up uh, how you want to label it and where and uh, what type, uh, wave, IF or whatever. And um, you direct it to a file um, where the project's in, so you then get lost. Like, it will happen sometimes. And then afterwards, uh, you load in a new um, line, uh, start up the, the X24 sampler. And then you go to songs and then um, load multiple samples. And from there you can, it's easy, you, you, you load it. It starts, you see, you get direction to the file you want to go. You also, you can search if it's not the right file. Uh, and you select everything you wanted to use. And then from there, uh, after of, while working, uh, the, some files doesn't sound correct 
you do the same thing. Uh, go give it another name because otherwise it gets really confused in there. Give it a slight other name. I, I work like melodic synth 09, 010 and etc etc. Uh, and then I know like uh, um, 013 is the new one, the better uh, one and you can, yeah, you can load it in. Yeah, it's also sometimes funny because I got a nice feeling in it and they've come in, no, it doesn't feel right. You know, it's not on time and I, it's just a little bit funky and then I move it and then I, okay. It, it, in, 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 the, in the progress, it's better to do it tight instead of the beginning of the feeling because the, the whole project will change. I used to do, you know, do things very fast and um, they've learned me to, you know, uh, think about it and listen very careful to it. So. Now it's like a few days we work on a, on a, on a project instead of one day what I normally do.